What's up, Rito? Shade Tree Surgeon here, only giving my intro because I don't know if Joe the Mountain Jedi has one yet. Hi. <laughs> we'll work on that. And today we're gonna jump right into it. No fat, only beef, baby, and we got plenty of that. Today we're talking about one of my many bad decisions, history of bad decisions, which is buying <laughs> sight unseen motorcycles off of Facebook Marketplace and crossing my fingers that they're gonna be just fine. Basically, this video is about the 10 words that every new motorcycle owner will utter to themselves themselves and how to avoid them. Oh my God, what did I get myself into? Trying to give you some ideas on what to look for whenever you're buying a bike, what to look for in a prospective bike, red flags that you need to keep an eye out for to keep you from going into deep, deep into the hole where you may get discouraged and may end up buying somebody else's headache. Something I do on the channel all the time is buy bikes off a of Facebook marketplace with a, a slightly educated guess on whether they're going to be good or not. I will tell you from experience, a $1,500 bike can turn into a $4,000 bike really quickly. Can confirm. So for all you guys out there who are looking for a great deal on Facebook Marketplace because they are out there, this video is for you. We're gonna go through this bike and we're gonna show you guys everything that you need, should, should, need? Should, need, hope, maybe, might, and... Definitely the stuff you should check on one of these motorcycles before you fork over your hard-earned cash. And also, if you do find a couple things wrong with it, give you a little bit of bargaining power. Couple things here and there, that's not necessarily a death sentence whenever you're looking at a prospective bike buy. Now, if you get enough of them, you got to stack them up and you got to use your own common sense. Do I want to deal with all this or do I want to look around and try to find something that's a little bit better off? That's up to y'all. Be the judge. On the center stand before us, we have uh, what we'll call the universal Japanese motorcycle. This is probably one of the most vanilla motorcycles that you're going to come across. Honda made these things for basically a blank slate type of bike to draw people into the market. First time riders or somebody that hadn't been into you know, into the sport for several years. They've been off the bike looking to come back. It's got its roots with the original CB750 from back in the, you know, late 60s, early 70s when the CB750 was the, the new hotness on the market. These were a great bike. They handled good. They rode good. They're very reliable. They're very economical. Maintenance costs on them is extremely low. This bike is 100% stone stock except for this JC Whitney looking sissy bar luggage track, whatever you want to call it. Man, I just dated myself there. People know what a J.C. Whitney I'll catalog tell you, is. That's a point in this thing's favor. If it hasn't been messed with, you're already on the up. Stock bike is worth more money than it a really modified is. bike. If you buy a bike that's got a ton of mods on it, somebody's pulled the airbox out and they've put the individual pod filters on the back of the carburetors and they've got some no-name exhaust system cobbled together on there, you got to wonder what else is going on down inside where you can't see. We're going to take a look at the obvious stuff here and any bike purchase needs to be considered, but also something that may give you a little bit of bargaining power whenever it comes time to lay out some cold hard cash. This right here would be on Facebook Marketplace for around $2,500. It's a running, riding Honda. You might say $3,500 if you're being real, real generous, but $2,500 is about what this motorcycle's worth in running and riding condition. But that's before we add up uh, anything else that might be going on with it. I was working at a Honda dealership in Northwest Arkansas, getting these things out of the crate back in the mid 90s. I think the MSRP when they first came out with this version of the Nighthawk in uh, 1991 was uh, $39.99. And that's one thing that Honda really pushed as a price point because it was affordable. Which is why you can find them all over the place because it's basically the Sportster of Japan. It was really easy to purchase, really easy to get into. So people would buy one of these, ride it around for a little while, and then park it and never ride it again. Kajita wears if you have coin. POV, you've just pulled up to a trailer park to buy your new Honda Nighthawk 750. What's the first <laughs> thing you look for, Joe? Obviously, whenever you're looking at any prospective bike, whenever you walk up to it to see it in the flesh, first thing that most people are gonna look at is a cosmetic condition. This one, eh, it's a little dusty, no big deal, that happens. You got a little scratch on the tank here Ooh. that may mostly buff out, some of it may not, but still, that's dropping the bucket stuff, especially considering we're on a motorcycle that's old enough to buy a beer. Let's put it like that. I can't do that math in my head right now because I haven't had enough coffee yet today. Outside of the scratch on the tank, look down here on the exhaust pipes and see if anybody's ever had an oopsie where they dropped it in the parking lot. Also, another good thing to kind of tip you off if the bike's ever been down before, look at the ends of the levers. If they've got any scabs or scratches on them or if the little balls on the end of them are broke off or if the grips are tore up, that's a surefire way of telling that, you know, it's been off of two wheels and not in the best of ways. This side over here, it looks just as good as that one. So I would venture to say that this bike has 
has never been dropped. It's not very often you see that happen on a motorcycle, especially once it's 20 plus years old. We got cosmetics out of the way. Nothing a good afternoon in the driveway with a bucket and a sponge isn't gonna take care of and a little bit of chrome polish. A little scratch on the tank, we're not gonna worry about that too much because we can deal with that whenever we feel like it. You got a little spot right here on the seat where the stitching's blown out, where it wraps around the seat pan. Again, that's kind of typical for a bike of this age. It draws up, it shrinks, it loses some of its pliability as it ages. This is an easy seat to recover. It's a cheap seat to have repaired. If you don't feel like doing it on your own, you can find an upholstery shop in your area that'll probably do it for a hundred bucks or less. And definitely listen to what you said about your local upholstery shop. They could have this done in about 15 minutes while you wait. Yes. So cosmetics out of the way. What's our next step in this hypothetical trailer park where our new Nighthawk 750 lives? The first thing, guy said it runs. Okay. Well, turn the key on. Dash lights light up. Hey, that's a plus. It's got a headlight. It's got a headlight with a high beam. Yeah. It's got four turn signals and they all work. That's shocking. Beep. And it's got a horn that beeps. That's actually kind of surprising whenever they get to this hold. Just for safety's sake. Yeah, we got a tail light. Yeah, we got a brake light. We got a brake light down there off the pedal. Okay, cool. So all of our bases are covered here. Let's see if it runs. I'm shocked. <laughs> okay, full disclosure for all the people in the peanut gallery that I know is gonna jump into comments. I rode this bike over here just a little bit ago, so it's already warmed up and yeah, I can say this beyond a shadow of a doubt. I walked up to this bike and I started it from a cold start using the choke. It popped off just a little rough and lumpy, but nothing bad whatsoever. And it smoothed out to normal fast idle in about 10 seconds and warmed up and I hopped my big chubby butt on the seat and I rode it from there. In another video, we'll go over what to do if you're trying to buy a bike that doesn't run, but hopefully if you're buying your first motorcycle and you're in this trailer park with your new to you Nighthawk 750, let's hope it's a motorcycle that does run because if you have limited mechanical experience and it doesn't run, you might consider running away yourself. And if you do have limited mechanical experience but you're not afraid to learn new things or taking on something new, we can teach you. So we've ascertained that the motorcycle runs so we can escape from Sunnyvale Trailer Park. What's next on the list? It runs fairly smooth. Can we make it better? Yeah, we can. But all in all, this ain't bad. We're showing 22, almost 23,000 miles on the clock. That's not high mileage. But there's a couple things that we do need to look at before you decide, okay, I love it. I'll take it. Here's my money. All the lights, all the blinkers, the brake lights, all that stuff works. We heard the thing crank over. It starts, it runs. Hey, great, cool. We're good, right? Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! Wrong. We need to look at some other stuff and do our due diligence to make sure we're not buying a lemon. Or also, even if the bike is in good shape, we need to make sure that we're not overpaying for it. Because yeah, unfortunately, there's some people out there that are kind of on the greedy side. And you know, I'm not above trying to make a little money here and there. The problem is, is I got a conscience. I got a real low limit as far as what I'm going to try to make off of somebody, especially somebody that's new to the sport. Because I've done this for 35 plus years and I've been blessed in that, that most most of the time, I haven't been screwed over. I'll tell you this, when it comes to motorcycles, you can always sell somebody a dream. The thing about a $2,500 bike, you could probably sell it for $3,500 because someone out there is willing to pay it just because they want it so damn bad, and that guy is usually me. Hey kids, look at the calendar. It's tax time, all right? <laughs> I know a lot of you guys have a fat wad of cash burning a hole in your hip pocket and you got very little impulse control, but please, for the love of God, slow your roll, stop and think just a little bit. Don't pay too much. <laughs> Let's go on and see what you shouldn't pay for. I'm gonna be straight with you. This bike isn't too bad. Bike's never been dropped down on the ground. It's never been crashed. If it has been crashed, they did a really good job of putting it back together. But me personally, I don't think this bike's ever hit terra firma. Now, one thing I noticed real quick whenever I walked up to it, if you look right down here, here on the valve cover, we got a little bit of funk and spooge there. And the reason it's collecting there, you got a real light oil leak here. This isn't terribly uncommon and this will happen on virtually any bike that has aged and especially something that's ridden very infrequently. This little rubber plug seals camshaft journal in the head where the cam journals are machined. It's got a little half moon piece of rubber that's made onto the valve cover gasket. Now, as these things age, rubber loses its pliability. It also draws up a little bit and it hardens somewhat. Now, that is a very low level leak. And to be honest with you, I've probably got worse than that going on on my bike right now. And I ain't gonna worry about that. It's something to keep in mind. And it's something that you might wanna point out to the prospective seller. Let's say you did wanna fix that minor oil leak. I know you wouldn't, 
wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't. But if somebody wanted to get that fixed and they weren't going to work on it themselves, about how much would you charge for that at the shop? Real world, if a customer brought this in to me, you're probably looking at about an hour and a half to two hour shop charge based on what your local shop's hourly rate is. Pull that valve cover gasket, put a new gasket on it, get you back on down the road. If you do your oil change at the same time, you're going to save yourself some money because you got a little bit of time here and a little bit of time here and they're going to overlap. So if you got time to budget for it, that's the best way to play it. So we're looking at anywhere from 200 to 250 bucks realistically to get that done. But when we're doing trailer park math, $250 does not equal $250 no, off it the does price. Not. And if you try to say that, old Leroy in the trailer park is uh, liable to get riled up. It's going to cost you $250 to do. You're looking at, I would say, more like possibly 100 bucks off the actual asking price if you're lucky. You got to be realistic with your expectations because the guy didn't make the thing leak on purpose. It's just age and time. Even if you bought the bike brand new out of the box back in the day, this is something that you were going to have to take care of on your dime no matter what. Like I said, be realistic. There's a little bit of give and take involved here. It runs, it starts, it makes motorcycle sounds. We already spotted that leak on the valve cover, so that's one thing that's kind of throwing a flag for me. If it's leaking there, is it low on oil? So let's take a peek. Most Honda motorcycles, Honda in particular, other brands do it, but Honda loves their dipsticks. It's not very common that you see a sight glass like a little window here in the side of the clutch cover on a Honda. It's gonna have a dipstick similar to a car. Any Honda motorcycle, if it's got a dipstick, you've got to have the bike sitting upright, either have somebody hold it straight up and down, or in this case, since we got a center stand, put it on a center stand, pull it out, wipe it off, drop it in there, pull it back out. Don't screw it in or else it's gonna read wrong. That's beautiful. That oil is fairly clean. It's still got good color to it. And most importantly, it is right there on the full mark. We don't have to worry about this thing being run low on oil. It's funny, whenever you run motorcycles out of oil, they're not happy motorcycles anymore. That's weird, man. You think they would just get over it. I know, right? <laughs> they're needy. It's a good idea, just since you're on that level, go ahead and take a flashlight if you got one or grab your phone. See if you can see like any fuel lines or vacuum lines that may look like they're dry rotted or trying to split or anything. See if there's any kind of corrosion going on that's significant on the motor. You know, just something that basically jumps out at you. Look, see if you got any oil spots on the motorcycle or any oil buildup on the bottom of the motorcycle. That, that's road funk. Don't worry about that. It'll wash. If you see any gas stains, something that looks, you know, kind of a tan brown color or something that's kind of crusty funky looking, look around the carburetors. Look around where the fuel pet cock is over on the other side of the gas tank. That's where you're going to see that stuff if you've got a fairly significant leak. If if you see something like that, again, it's not a death blow, but it's something to consider. So coming over to the left-hand side of the motorcycle, a couple things here. That's not a gas stain, that's rust. Don't worry about that. Motorcycles get wet, things corrode, it happens. What I was talking about, about looking for bad fuel lines, dry rot, things like that. Look real close right here. This vacuum line runs from the fuel pet cock on the tank down here to the intake manifold. This is a vacuum operated pet cock. Whenever the motor's running, it's creating engine vacuum. That opens a valve inside the petcock to allow fuel to flow to the carburetors. It's there mostly as a safety precaution because what it does, if the bike falls on its side, you know, if you have an oopsie, it shuts off fuel to the carburetors. That way you're not swimming in a lake of gasoline while you're trying to pick this thing up. Also, if you get a little bit of trash in your carburetors, it keeps the carbs from running over and creating a giant pool of gasoline that you may or may not be aware of in your garage when you're sleeping at three o'clock in the morning. Here's Speaking where, from experience. Yes. There's about three inches worth of hose there. That three inches can cause you a tow truck ride pretty quick because if we flex that just a little bit and you look right there, see how it's dry rotted and it's starting to crack through? That'll cause a vacuum leak and a vacuum pet cock has to have vacuum to work. If this breaks, not only is it going to make the bike run bad from having a vacuum leak until it runs out of gas, that is, because if there's no vacuum being applied to this pet cock, it's not going to allow fuel to go down to the carburetors and you are stuck on the side of the road. Got a little vacuum leak on a little bitty vacuum hose, not a deal breaker. That takes 30 seconds and 20 cents worth of hose to fix. Just to give you an idea of how the bike's been treated throughout its life, let's take a look at the air filter. Now on some bikes, air filter is really easy to get to. Usually you pop the seat up and you've got access to it right there. On this one, it's a little different. You got to pull the side cover off and then it's got some Phillips screws here where you pull this little trap door off the side of the air box and the filter will be inside there. The fact that all of these screws are here and they all match, two things. Either somebody was up on their maintenance and they actually paid attention and they didn't lose anything or nobody ever looked at it. So <laughs> I usually it's the latter. Pull this little guy out right here and hot, oh, looky there, kids. 
Uh-oh. That would be a reason why this bike's running a little bit puny. Honda's real big on using paper throwaway air filters, kind of like a car. Most of the other manufacturers, they use a washable foam element. This is a mouse nest. We get all that out of there. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot. Yikes. Well, I ain't come across any turds yet, so that's a plus. <laughs> yeah, dude, that was freaking Stuart Little was hanging out in there, buddy. Just so everybody knows, this is the side the dirty air comes into. With it being here, it's not gonna get pulled into the motor because all of the filter media here on the outside is still in good shape and it doesn't look like anything's been chewed through. But this definitely sat for a while if a mouse had time to make a nest in there. Yeah. We got all that out, or most of it. You can look down inside there. None of the, the ribs on that paper has been chewed up or anything. That's a good thing, okay? That means you don't have to worry about any of this getting sucked into the motor. I would still replace this, absolutely, but that gives you some assurance that all of that isn't hiding out in here. If you haven't been given the whole story on one of these bikes, this is definitely going to be a chapter in that story. And that chapter is, it sat for a while. If a motorcycle's been sitting long enough that rodents have been setting up camp in it, it's been parked for more than just a couple of weeks, folks. Now that we've figured out somebody tried to turn the airbox into an Airbnb, we need to start thinking about prices of an air filter. Real world, I haven't looked this up, but generally OEM type replacement air filter from either MGO or High Flow, they're gonna run in the neighborhood of 20, $25. So, Again, not a big expenditure. But if you're looking at this stuff and the guy that's trying to sell the bike is standing right there next to you, and then you point to that and go, hey, what about that? That gives you some leverage while you're down here. Another thing that you want to look at, most motorcycles are a chain driven type of vehicle. That means they've got a drive chain that connects the motor to the rear wheel and that's what makes the motorcycle move forward. The majority of Harleys and also a, a fair amount of the metric bikes, they use a drive belt and it's got a different set of rules. Touring bikes like gold wings, things like that, they forgo both of those and they just use a shaft to drive them. And those are very low maintenance. We'll touch on that in another video. But when you're looking at a perspective bike, here's something you need to look at. Chain's a little bit rusty, not a big deal. Couple key things. Let's make sure it's not just stupid loose. That's a little loose, but it ain't bad. Another thing to look at is how much wear it's got on it. Now, as loose as that chain is, if you grab a chain link right here by the pin and you pull it straight in line with the swing arm, if you can lift that away from the sprocket a half of an inch or more, that's telling you that that chain is towards the end of its useful lifespan. See, I can pull it up a little bit, but not even a quarter of an inch. This chain and sprocket set, they're still in real good shape. They've got a lot of usable life left in them. They're just a little grubby. They need cleaned up. It needs looped. That's all you got to worry about there. Since you're down here, all tires since the very early 2000s, after the big Firestone debacle when tires were blowing up right and left and causing Ford Explorers to roll over and play dead, it's a federal mandate that any highway tire has to have a DOT date on there. What that is, is that gives you the information of how old that tire is, what week and what month it was produced in. Here, I'll show you how to read them. If we look around on this tire, there's a lot of different numbers molded in here. Ply rating, load rating, the size. This one right here is the one that we're looking for. It will always be a four digit number all to its own inside of a little oval here. And this number on this one is 5007. What that means is this tire was produced in the 50th week of the 2007 calendar year. That tire is, for all practical purposes, almost 18 years old. We've got good tread life left on this tire. We don't see any obvious dry rot, but it's an almost 18 year old tire, folks. I wouldn't send a customer out on that. Me personally, I've rode stuff like that because I had to, not because I wanted to. I would get that off of there and plan on investing in tires very quickly. Now that's where you got some bargaining power. Even though these tires have good tread life on them, they're old, they're dried out, they need to come off of there. Because as tires age, they lose a certain amount of natural oils to them, they lose their flexibility, and also they lose some of their grippiness, particularly when you're in the rain. It's a whole lot slicker in the rain, no matter how much tread life is left on the tire itself, because the compound of the rubber has to be pliable enough to grip the road surface even when it's wet. Now, I can't tell you how many bikes I've gone to look at, and old Leroy says tires have plenty of tread left, and then the tires end up being old enough to act in some of our other videos. Yeah, <laughs> this tire is a 
Metzler Road Tech. This is not the OEM tire that came on this bike. This tire has obviously been replaced. 2408. So this front tire was made in the 24th week of 2008. These tires are aged out and they need to come off of the bike. Now, can you ride on them? Yeah. Can you ride the bike home with them? Sure. Yeah. Obviously check your tire pressure, but for safety's sake, budget for some tires. While we're down here, we need to go ahead and look at the brakes too, just to see what kind of shape they're in. It's got a hydraulic disc brake on the front. It's got an old school drum on the back. That brake rotor, fairly smooth. Doesn't have a whole lot of wave to it or anything. No corrosion to speak of. The only tricky part without taking it apart, take a flashlight or everybody's got a cell phone. I'm sure you got a, a flashlight app on your cell phone. Look right down here where the brake pad makes contact with the rotor. This part right here, that is the steel backing plate for the brake pad. The friction lining is bonded to that. The friction lining is what we care about. Now, we've got plenty of thickness on this. These brakes have very minimal wear on them, so I wouldn't even be concerned about that for a good long time. Now, the rear brakes on this bike are a drum brake. They're not very easily accessible unless you take the tire off. Nobody that's trying to sell a bike is going to be on board with you pulling a wheel off the thing in their driveway because, number one, they don't know if you know what you're doing. Number two, they're looking to sell a bike, not have somebody pick it apart. Most motorcycles, not all, but most that have a drum brake, they'll have a little indicator tab on the brake arm here. That's what this little tab is. If you look close, it's got a little arrow stamped into it, and we've got a little arrow cast into that post right there. If you press on the brake pedal, the brakes are making contact, not hosting on it, but if this arrow lines up with this arrow, then the brake shoes are worn out and they need to be replaced. We got plenty of life left on those. One thing to look for on the brake side of things, and this is something that happens on any motorcycle, it's going to happen as they age, as they sit out in the weather. Listen close here. That creaky noise, what that is, is that's the brake lever binding up a little bit from a little bit of corrosion and it needs a little bit of grease here and there. It just needs a little bit of love. Again, this is normal maintenance. While you're there, take a look at the fluid that's in the brake master cylinder. Most motorcycles have some type of sight glass on them to where you can look real quick and see what condition the fluid's in. Now this is starting to get kind of brown. It's not terrible. Again, it's something that I would consider just for peace of mind, flush it out, get some new fluid in there. If you keep the fluid in the master cylinders fresh, you don't have to worry about corrosion in the brake system, causing a brake caliper to try to stick and drag or worse, lock up on you. I'm a good walking example of that. I had a customer's bike try to kill me about nine months ago whenever one of the front calipers on the front wheel locked up on me with no warning when I was doing a test ride. And I ended up eating shit at about 30 mile an hour and I came up with a busted collarbone and nine broke ribs out of the deal. Zero of five stars, would not recommend so uh, my $2,500 bike is all of a sudden not looking like a $2,500 bike anymore, even though that's what was paid for it. So we're, but price is going up and by a significant amount at this point. How much well, was that air filter again? Uh, 25, 30 bucks on the outside. You're not gonna have to go sell plasma to be able to afford it. And even though it's only 20 bucks and it's pretty easy to get to, not everyone's gonna feel comfortable doing that. What do you think a shop would charge to pop that in there? Most shops have a half hour shop minimum for any kind of repair work or anything like that. Uh, if you've got a good independent shop that's you know pretty laid back and realistic, they may not charge you as much, but most shops as a rule of thumb are gonna have a half hour shop minimum fee that they charge based on whatever their labor rate is. If they charge a hundred bucks an hour for working on your bike, then they're gonna charge you 50 bucks for putting an air filter in and real world, it takes about three minutes of your time and the only special tool you need is a plain Jane screwdriver. Going on a little more complicated than that, I know from talking to people, a lot of people are really Really afraid to mess with brakes. So I think it's way more common that someone's going to want to pay for that brake flush than the air filter because they just don't feel comfortable messing around with brakes. A lot of people will let their ego overrule their common sense and they're like, well, I can do that. <laughs> and then they're on the phone to people like me asking me, hey, how do I fix this? Because I fucked it up. If you're not very comfortable with just the idea of basic maintenance, like changing your own oil and things like that, please, 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 for safety's sake and for your peace of mind, find a reputable shop whenever you're talking about flushing the brakes, you know, flushing the brake fluid, any kind of brake system service, take it to somebody that knows what they're doing and also what to look for to keep you out of trouble. On this bike, it's a single caliper system. You've got one master cylinder on the front, you've got one caliper on the front wheel. Real world, this is probably gonna be a half hour to 45 minute job, plus the cost of however much fluid and shop chemicals that they use. Call it a hundred bucks, just to make the math simpler. You know, if you pay somebody to do it, dot three and dot four, 
pore break fluid is hygroscopic. Now that's a $10 word to say it will absorb water. It will literally pull water out of the air you breathe. If you get a high enough concentration of water in the brake fluid, it lowers the boiling point of the brake fluid. If you get a high enough water concentration in your brake fluid, eventually that water concentration in the fluid is going to condense into droplets of water. Water has a heavier specific gravity than brake fluid. You can take a jar of brake fluid, take a medicine dropper, drop one drop of water in it, and it's going to sink to the bottom. That's where things get scary on this because if you have enough water saturation in your brake fluid, that water is going to end up in the brake caliper down there by the wheel. And that is also where your brakes get the hottest at. So if you've got a couple of drops of water that's migrated down into the brake caliper from lack of maintenance, and if you're heavy handed on the brake lever, if you do get the brake caliper hot enough to actually hit 212 degrees, that little bitty droplet of water is going to start boiling into a big old air bubble and your brakes are going to say, see it, and you're not going to have any. So there's one thing down there that stood out as, uh, I don't know, maybe tied for dangerous on the brakes, <laughs> and, uh, but definitely more expensive, and that's the tires. Tires, nobody wants to pay for them. Everybody wants to run until the belts are showing. What is this gonna cost us for this $2,500 trailer park bike? What's that gonna cost us in tires? Real world tires for this bike, they're not a bank breaker. Can you spend a lot of money on tires? Yeah, sure, if you buy the, the neatest, hippest, coolest thing out there, but there's, several affordable options out there to be had. Now, this bike in particular, it's got some tire sizes on it that are a little less than what I would call common run of the mill. That doesn't mean that there's not still some good stuff out there at a good price. Do your homework, read some reviews. Don't ever go into an internet forum and ask them what the best tire is. <laughs> Don't ever ask them what the best oil is. You are playing with fire there. I guarantee there's already a fight in the comment section about tires. Probably, yeah. But real world, let's just to throw a number at it. Your average front tire is gonna run somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to $125 for this particular motorcycle. Some are cheaper, some are more expensive. The rear tire on this motorcycle is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 to 175, depending on what brand you get and who you buy it from. This is one of those things where it does pay to shop around because some people will charge suggested retail pricing on tires at a, at a shop and I don't particularly agree with that because the markup on tires is huge. There are several online vendors that you can go through. I don't want to drop one right here because I don't want to start a piss and match in the comment section. <coughs> here at MotorTire.com. You know, if you uh, look around, I'm sure you can find something out there pretty cheap. So we're looking at about 300 bucks to put a front and a rear tire on this. Now, in another video, we might get into how to change your own tire yourself, but most people are going to have to take their bike to a shop. Now, if you can get the tires off the bike and take them to the shop, awesome. It's going to cost you less. But yep. let's say we don't do that. We have no way to accomplish that. We're just dropping the motorcycle off. We're asking the shop to put our $300 worth of tires on our bike. What's that gonna cost us in labor? Generally on a bike like this, you don't have any saddlebags. It's very accessible. It's an easy bike to work on. Most shops on average are gonna charge you anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to mount and balance each tire when you bring the bike in. Again, say we're coming from a $100 an hour standpoint, you're looking at 200 bucks worth of shop labor on average to get two tires mounted and balanced on the bike. This $2,500 bike just turned into a $3,000 bike before I had <laughs> before I did anything else. So. You think motorcycles are expensive, you are try having kids. <laughs> Check the tires. I, I think personally, that's one of your biggest bargaining points. That is only if the person that you're buying it from believes in date codes. Trust me, they're real. The earth is also round. That doesn't mean everybody believes it to be so. Exactly. So you're gonna have to figure out whether you could have that argument with that person, and I don't know how that's gonna go. But $500? That's a big chunk of change. When you're talking about a $2,500 bike, I'm not gonna try to do that math with my shoes on. That's 20%. <laughs> hey man, I'm impressed. Kind of, he I he can do head. math. I did that in my head. That's 20% of the entire price of the bike. If you can't bargain with that to get the price down, that dude ain't yeah. budging at all. And then you need to make a decision on how bad you actually want that bike. Right, exactly. Not only how badly do you want that bike, how much are you willing to commit to that bike to do what needs to be done without taking a shortcut and getting your ass in a jam. And just like we said before, $500 your money spent does not equal $500 off a 
off the price. If you can get that, great. But again, you're looking at maybe a 50% turnover. If you can get $250 to $300 off the price because you got to put two tires on the bike, I think that that is within the realm of reason. Anybody that's being realistic about a, a vehicle that they're selling, like this bike, for example, if you go up to the guy that's selling it and say, hey, the tires are old on this thing. General rule of thumb in the industry, if a motorcycle tire is seven to eight years old, that tire is at the end of its useful lifespan and it really does legitimately need to be replaced. If you go up to a guy and say, hey, the tires on this thing are old enough to vote. I don't feel real good about it. I like the rest of the bike as it is and everything, but I'm kind of worried about the tires and, you know, for my peace of mind and my personal safety, I got to figure on putting a set of tires on here. I'm going to have five bills out of pocket. Tell you what, man, I like the bike. I want to buy it from you. The tires are kind of getting me hung up on a little bit. How about you meet me in the middle? Let's take this 2,500 bucks down to say 2,250. And most guys, if they're being reasonable, and if you're, you know, if you're polite with them and just straightforward and to the point, they're going to take that into consideration. They may throw a different number back at you, but that gets your foot in the door to where you can start talking back and forth a little on and start doing a little bit of horse trading. And we ain't done. Let's move on to, uh, the electrical system. This is one thing that a lot of people buy and it's kind of the silent killer, if you will, of hopes and dreams. Motorcycles run on gasoline, but you gotta have electricity to make them go vroom vroom. Just to throw a word of warning out there for people, if you go looking at an older bike and the prospective seller says, Oh, I just put a brand new battery in there. Do yourself a favor. Go to Harbor Freight, spend eight bucks, buy one of these little cheap voltmeters here. They used to give these things away for free all the time back in the day when we had coupons. Those days are long gone. So you gotta actually pay real money for them now. Still, they're $7, folks. I mean, that's less than a double quarter pounder at McDonald's. This will save you a lot of money and also give you a lot of information. I feel kind of like a hypocrite right now because I got a bunch of these things and I use them all the time. But this one in particular that I'm holding in my hand, the battery in it is near death. And I'm glad I checked it because a while ago, this thing was giving me all kinds of wonky ratings and everything. So, well, that's not your fault. That's my fault. I was in charge of that voltmeter. Luckily, we have a backup that I also got for me. 100% of my voltmeters are yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go back to Old Faithful here. Quick way to save yourself a lot of money and also give yourself a lot of knowledge and a lot of buying power. Check the battery. And let's check to make sure this thing's charging when it's running. Most metric motorcycles, not all, but most, the seat comes off with the key, with the key lock somewhere on the ass end of the bike. Battery's dirty, it doesn't mean it's bad, but what that tells you is, it's been in there for a while. Nobody's been in here with throwing a new battery in it, trying to pull a slick one on you. If I've seen it once, I've seen it a thousand times. Somebody will buy a bike off of Craigslist, it'll have a brand new battery, 20, 30 miles up the road, it dies. Well, it's a used bike, it's your baby, you bought it. Then they call me up on the phone, we get the bike in the shop, we check it out. Hey, guess what, bub? Your stator is bad and your voltage regulator is smoked and it killed that brand new battery. So you're looking at having to buy a stator, a regulator, and another brand new battery on a bike that you just bought. Get a voltmeter, set it to DC volts, in this case that range is 20 on this particular meter. See what kind of voltage it's showing with the key off, 12.5 volts. Battery's a little bit low, but that's not bad. If that thing was showing any less than 11 volts, that'd be a big flag for me telling me that that battery is on the verge of death. Let's start it up. Okay, bike's running. Right there, that battery voltage went down a little bit. Now that's not out of the ordinary because things like headlights, tail lights, turn signals, the ignition, they're all using electricity to run. At a normal idle, that's not where you check your charging system. Put the meter on it, and then rev the bike up a little bit. Hold it at a fast idle. Say about 2,000 RPM if you've got a tack on it, or just something that sounds like a fast idle if you don't have one. Look and see what it's charging there. 14.6 or so. Hey, that's great. There is one more thing that we need to check though, just to make sure that we don't have any charging issues. So let's go ahead and rev it. Hold the RPMs up for a while, you know, 30 seconds or so, and watch the voltmeter. You want to make sure that voltmeter doesn't go over 14.7, 14.8 volts. If you see 15 volts at any time, that's a danger sign because that's letting you know that the voltage regulator is not able to cut the, vo the voltage off of the battery and that battery is actually being overcharged. And if they overcharge, that can lead to a whole slew of things. Obviously a failed battery. Worst case scenario, especially if you've got a bike with an older wet cell style battery that has a vent tube, if you're overcharging one of those 
batteries, it boils the electrolyte out of the battery. It's gonna get blown out of the vent tube and nine times out of 10, nobody puts those things on, right? So it's gonna blow battery acid all over your bike and wherever it's around the battery and that's gonna set you up for a bunch of rust. Not to mention, it's gonna kill your battery. We know about tires. We know that the charging system's working. We know that the motor's not fixing to fall out in the driveway. We think we're home free, right? Wrong. There's one last thing that you need to look at and honestly, it's one of the first things I look at whenever I get a bike in the shop. You need to see what the inside of the gas tank looks like, especially on a carbureted bike. Take two seconds, pop the thing open, look down inside there. That tank looks gorgeous. This dirt and funk here, yeah, I give it a bath, but I care about what's down inside there. Any kind of rust in a gas tank, anything that you can see, that is a prelude to a repair build because if you can see stuff in the filler neck, then it's gonna be a lot worse in other places, particularly on the left-hand side of the tank because 99% of the time get parked on the kickstand leaning over to the left. If it's had some old bunk gas with some water in it that's been sitting there for a while, it's all gonna migrate over to the left-hand side. If you got rust in the gas tank, number one, you need to figure out how bad it is. Most motorcycle shops have the ability to look down inside of a gas tank with a bore scope or a, basically it's a camera on a flexible stick if you will without getting too technical about it. I've got one. They're cheap. If you want to buy one for yourself, hey, they're under 20 bucks on Amazon and they plug into your phone. I'll take one. I'll run it down inside the gas tank. See what this half of the gas tank looks like down inside here. If you've got a significant amount of rust, yeah, you're gonna have to look at, you know, dealing with that rust and getting it out of there and also sealing the tank up to where it doesn't come back. In our case here, we dodged a bullet. We got a good one. There's no rust evidence in there. You know, we don't have anything to worry about. All right, we're almost on the tail end of picking this damn thing apart. Lastly, you know, just from uh, dealing with it on the daily thing, you know, look at your hand controls. Brake lever, a little bit squeaky there. No big deal. We talked about that. It just needs a little dab of grease and some cleaning. Throttle, you know, throttle snapping back good. Cable may be a little on the loose side, but that's just a simple adjustment. For your clutch and everything, Yep, got a little squeaky there. You know, it's a little bit slack, but not much. But again, you know, this is just basic maintenance stuff. Make sure all your switches work good and they snap back positive. On metric bikes, with the majority of the way the switches are made, if these bikes sit out in the weather for a long period of time, the switches will feel kind of mushy. They won't really have a good positive click to them. Like whenever you hit the dimmer switch or, you know, whenever you, uh, actually that's a good one right there, that turn signal switch where it cancels. That's a little sticky, a little gummy. Nothing a good quick shot of contact cleaner and then a shot of silicone spray ain't gonna take care of. Since it's got carburetors, it's got a choke. Technically that's misleading because it doesn't physically choke off airflow into the carburetors like it did 30 odd years ago when we had an actual choke, but the name just stuck. What this is, is it's an enrichener. Now, if you look down here on the side of the carburetor, whenever you pull the choke lever, you can see how it lifts up this little plunger that's the enrichener valve. And what that does is that raises idle speed and plus it makes the mixture just a little bit richer. That way it'll start and warm up quicker. You wanna make sure that that is returning. So we flip the lever up, that's snapping down nice and solid on its own. You know, it's not hanging up, it's not sticking or anything. If you got a choke that's sticking, it'll make them run a little bit weird. Not to mention it'll make your gas mileage go in the toilet. Again, this is just a basic maintenance thing but it is something to watch out for. Well guys, I'll tell you, Joe just ran through a bunch of stuff that I normally don't do when I'm picking up a motorcycle because I get so dang excited about a new bike. So I just forget all the bad stuff and I only look at the good and there could be just one good thing. I'll find it. I'm an eternal optimist. I need people like Joe to keep me in check. Hey man, I do it too, okay? A lot of the stuff that's going on with this bike, it's normal maintenance. If you bought this bike brand new off the showroom floor 20 odd years ago in 1997, whenever it was up for sale, fast forward to today, you're having to deal with the same stuff. Now, that being said, if a guy's being realistic and he's willing to work with you on selling the bike and everything, after you point out the obvious stuff, like the tires being aged out and the oil leak that we found, and not to mention, you know, Stuart Little's vacation home, throw him a number. Don't be afraid to insult somebody, but just tell them, say, hey, I've got a couple of concerns and I'm not trying to disrespect you or be rude about it, but considering what I'm going to have in this bike to put tires on it, get it serviced, get an oil leak taken care of, do the basic maintenance and also get a, a new air filter for it. To me, I can 
legitimately say that I'd feel good about paying $2,000 for this bike. I know you're asking $2,500. Let's talk two grand. What can we do here? And the worst he can tell you is no. If he's being realistic about things, he'll take that into consideration and he'll come back at you with the number. It may not be the number that you're wanting to hear, but make sure that he's got your phone number and just tell him, say, hey, I really, considering that I've got to put tires on the bike and I got a few things I got to deal with, I'm really stuck on two grand and that's about all I can spend on this motorcycle. 500 bucks for a bike that's got these kind of things going on. You got to be willing to walk away. Yeah. If you're not willing to walk away, you have zero bargaining power. I don't care what's wrong with the bike. Especially on stuff like this, cash talks. I don't pay anybody with PayPal. I haven't carried a checkbook in God knows how long. I'm not going to try to sell somebody or, you know, give them a credit card number to where they can run it to their bank or bring them a cashier's check. Folding dinero, American greenbacks, in that talks. person. Because saying you got cash on a Facebook messenger message, that don't mean shit to a tree. You got cash in your pocket in front of somebody and they can see all them $20 bills in your hand when you're going to buy a motorcycle, a used motorcycle. This is something you should always arm yourself with, a gun. I've never gone to pick up a used bike without a firearm, especially when you're carrying around a few thousand dollars cash. I'm not gonna open up that can of worms. Uh, people that know me know that I am extremely pro 2A. However, <laughs> let's just put it like this. Even though I may walk through the valley of the shadow, I shall fear no evil because Samuel Colt is with me. <laughs> all in all, for 2,500 bucks, I still think that this was a pretty good deal, but let's be realistic, even though I'm gonna be able to do a lot of this work myself. This wasn't a $2,500 bike. This was a $3,000 bike. Let's be real. Now, if I could have got it for two grand, it would have been a $2,500 bike. Do your homework, do your research, and be willing to walk away if those things start adding up and it's more work than you want to do. Can't win all of them. And the thing is, if you shake a guy's hand, leave him your phone number or how to get in touch with you, and you decide, you know what, I need to pull the plug on this, I've done that several times. Probably eight times out of 10, whenever I've gotten on my bike or in the truck, whatever, whenever I'm driving away, most of the time, I make it a couple of blocks down the road and my phone starts ringing. They get a chance to ponder on it, and then all of a sudden, it just makes sense. They want to sell a bike. You want to buy a bike. They need cash. You have cash. Hmm. Yeah. You're fixing to buy a bike if you get that phone call. Obviously, we didn't go over every single thing that you need to look for on a used motorcycle, and every motorcycle's different. Even motorcycles that are the same brand and model are different yeah. throughout the years. There's still a lot more to know, a lot more to learn, and there's a couple things I've got for you in that regard. One is, make sure you hit that subscribe button because my man Joe the Mountain Jedi is gonna have a regular day here on the Shade Tree Surgeon channel. We're gonna be doing a lot of stuff like this, tech tips, tools, how to buy a bike, how to maintain your motorcycle, and anything else you might suggest down below. Also, I will say this, there is a Shade Tree Surgeon Patreon, which is the gateway to the Shade Tree Army Discord, of which Joe the Mountain Jedi is a frequent haunt. I hang out there at all hours of the day and night, and a lot of people question if I ever sleep. Yes, I do. So if you're part of the Discord and you're part of the Patreon or you're a member here on YouTube, when he's available, I can't guarantee he's there all the time, but he answers a lot of questions in that Discord. You can show him bikes you're looking at, and he's gonna give you really good advice. Now. Is that gonna be advice you like? Usually not if you've got a dream in your heart and you really want that bike. It's gonna be advice you don't like at all, but that's the advice you want. Oh great, now you've made me the killer of hopes and dreams, thanks. You are the killer of hopes and dreams, man, and I am made of hopes and dreams. It's a little bit of a yin yang situation going on here. Well, on the upside here, if somebody hits me up with a question on Discord or something like that, or if they if they know what they need and they just don't know where to get it, I'm real good at kicking over rocks, and uh, if I can help you save some money, I damn sure will. Uh, I'll shoot you a link, tell you where to look. If there's a cheaper option out there, got no problem sharing it with you, because the thing is, knowledge unshared, that's knowledge lost. And if I check out tomorrow, it ain't do me no good to keep it all to myself. That's fair, man. Make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave a like on the video. Leave a comment letting us know what kind of stuff you'd like us to do next with Joe the Mountain Jedi on his day here, which is as of yet undecided. I think it's going to be Mondays. And next time, we have uh, another Honda four-cylinder universal Japanese motorcycle. It's just in a lot worse shape than this one. I got lucky on this bike. The next one, we're not so lucky. Crashing through the sky comes a fearful cry. Shade tree. Army. Shade tree. Army. Armies of the night. Evil taking flight. Shade tree. Army. Shade tree. Army. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Panic spreading far and wide. Can the world oppose the deadliest of foes?
They never say die, walking tall with banners high. Shade Tree Army, a ruthless gang of scum, villains, freaks, and bikers determined to rule the world. 